on Conrad. Oh yes, okay, the recording, got it. All right, I'll start again. <laughs> Greetings everybody and welcome to our Society for Women of Ideas panel on Hedvig Conrad Martius called uh, Questions of Being and Phenomenology. We have three special guests here and I'm going to let Antonio Calcano introduce them. They will each give papers and then after that he is going to open up the floor to for discussion. So thanks everyone for coming and uh, let's begin. Go ahead, Antonio. So welcome everyone to this event. Um, it's so wonderful to see uh, old friends and um, uh, new friends, hopefully at this event. Um, I'm particularly grateful to Diane Enns and the Society for Women in Philosophy for the possibility of hosting this event and for bringing forward the legacy of, of a thinker that I think is um, so foundational for 20th century phenomenology and philosophy in general. And so um, the goal of the society, of course, is to promote um, uh, and to introduce and to bring forward not only historical figures uh, of uh, women who have had ideas in the sciences, in art, in philosophy, in music, and so on, but also um, to uh, um, bring forward new ideas. And it's my hope that our conversation today will introduce um, the, uh, us all to new ideas and new possibilities through Hedvig Conrad Martius. So thanks to Diane for the creation of this wonderful society and to the and to Brianne who is helping us here today and who has been so um, important for us as we launched this initiative. So thank you to both of you. And um, it is my pleasure really to introduce um, three top outstanding scholars of Hedvig Conrad Martius's work and philosophy. Um, uh, and uh, I have studied their work, these scholars, and I am so proud to be able to um, have them here with us and to introduce them to you today. So we have with us today uh, Irene Breuer from Wuppertal University, uh, uh, Simona Bertolini from the University of Parma, and Ronnie Miron uh, from Bar Ilan University in Israel. Uh, they are well-known established scholars of phenomenology and Hedvig Conrad Martius's work. And um, what we're going to do today is each speaker will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. And um, the idea is that each speaker presents something of an aspect or um, parts of the biography of Hedvig Conrad Martius that they find moving. Um, so, and um, perhaps um, uh, uh, that can um, uh, um, allow us to enter more deeply into Hedvig Conrad Martius's thought. But also at the end of the talks, uh, we will have a discussion uh, and maybe a conversation that all of us can join in order to um, synthesize, maybe metabolize the rich ideas that are brought forward by the speakers and so on. So what I'll do is I'll um, I'll just present each speaker first, uh, so as they before they begin to speak, and then I'll just turn over the floor to them. Uh, so I'll begin with um, we'll start with Irene Breuer, then move to Simona Bertolini, and then finally Ronnie Miron. So without further ado, I'd like to present um, Irene Breuer to you. The talk today is uh, the title of her talk today is the reality, the real reality. Wirkliche Wirklichkeit of the world. Uh, of course, uh, this is in reference to uh, Hedwig Conrad Martius's long um, quarrel and deep insight into the nature of the real and the role of the real in philosophy and phenomenology. And so without further ado, um, Irene, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. Uh... doesn't allow me no it doesn't work I don't know why doesn't work I don't know what is 
what is here wrong, but it doesn't work. No. Bri so, Brianne, I, I sorry, maybe, Brianne, yeah. did you, you made her co-host, yeah. right? Yeah, she's co-host. Okay, so it should work. So it must, perhaps it's something on your end. Is there another way that she could do this? Um, do you see my screen now? Do you no. see my paper? No. Maybe, maybe you can send it as an email attachment and then one of us will share it. Yes, but it will take a lot of time and yeah. um, it is, uh, we are uh, really uh, very, we have an adjusted time. So don't worry, I'll have to read it. Uh, please tell me if I'm clear enough. So um, yeah. I start by thanking Antonio and Diane uh, for the wonderful organization and for the opportunity to give here a talk. I'm very flattered. So I start my paper with uh, about the real reality of the world. The clarification of the sense of the world and of the notion of reality was a constant concern on the part of Edmund Husserl, the founder of phenomenology. Phenomenology inquires into the sense of reality, the factual one we live in, as it is given in transcendental experience. For this purpose, Husserlian phenomenology recurs to the epoche, the bracketing of actual existence, and to the, to the transcendental reduction, such that the world is not regarded as actuality, but is transcendentally reduced to an actuality phenomenon, that is, to an intentional noema. The strongest motive for this epoche is to understand how the subject is related to the world. This does not mean that the appearing of the world is nothing other than an immanent experience of the subject. Rather, the world confirms its existence in the harmonious course of its intuitive appearances. What Husserl calls the real object is the identity of sense that is actualized in the process of perception. As Husserl explains, the reality of the thing, Wirklichkeit des Dinges, is that which remains identical in all appearances, that is, a moment of being, ein Seinsmoment, which must not be mistaken for the transcendent reality, that is, for the real thing in itself, das wirkliche Ding itself. The being of the world is the being of any possible world, that is, it has a transcendental value, its sense is endowed by the transcendental ego. This is also one of the main concerns of Husserl's disciple, Hedwig Conrad Matthews. In her endeavor to set up a real ontological architectonics, Conrad Matthews provided Husserl's phenomenology with an ontic substructure that resumed Aristotelian ontology. Conrad Matthews tries to show that the world contains a real being or a core of selfhood. Her investigations are aimed at the epistemological question of whether the phenomenon corresponds to a reality independent of consciousness. In order to examine the ontological question about the essence of reality, that is the real reality, Conrad Matthews revises the Husserlian concept of intentionality. Intentionality transcends the boundaries of the objects constituted by consciousness and captures the nature or essence of the consciousness transcending substance itself, even though its existence can only be hypothetically posited. In contrast to Husserl's own ecological transcendental objectivation, Conrad Matthews posits her own conception of a transcendent objectivation of the world, according to which the real intent entity is the ground and bearer of its own being. Hence, Conrad Matthews' most original contribution to phenomenology lies both in the real ontological conception of the essence of reality or the real reality, wirkliche Wirklichkeit, and her peculiar synthesis of metaphysics and scientific inquiries about the origin of the world, which thus can be considered as a first approach to a phenomenological, phenomenological realism. In fact, her inquiries aim at allowing the appearance of what is appearing to appear through itself, that is, without or before the conditions that the subject would impose on it. On it. I come to the first point, ontological phenology. Conrad Matthews neither rejects 
Busso's abstention from judgment regarding the existence of a given reality, the epoche, nor the eidetic redaction. Rather, in her investigations into the autonomy of Dasein, Conrad Matius developed her own conception of the transcendental redaction. For Conrad Matius, the self-presentation of a structure as an appearance is directly related to the self-announcement of the phenomenon of reality. The essence of this structure is not only that it presents itself as an appearance or phenomenon as in Bussell, but also that it indicates the independent existence of an object. While an appearance is what makes the object knowable, conversely, the material entity immediately behind the appearance is something that, by being, also shows itself and shows itself as what it is, so says Conrad Matius. This is a central thesis of Conrad Matius' entire real ontology. For Conrad Matius, the meaning of the object of perception is already immediately given to us in the sensuous appearance and therefore does not require any word by the consciousness to constitute meaning. Since the object that appears stand for themselves and announce themselves for their own autonomous reason, Self-appearance is at the same time self-presentation. A material existence actually asserts itself as a self-presenting one so that this self-asserting as transcendence testifies to its real autonomy. What is revealed here is the reality character, realitets character, or the factuality, facticitate of that which the senses appearance shows in its qualitative attributes. Hence, the facticity of the autonomous existence is expressed in the sensuous mode of the givenness of the object. However, this does not mean that the transcendent can be equated with external reality. This becomes clear upon considering the distinctions Conrad Matius introduces between the layers in man in true reality. First, the appearing as a mere object of appearance, that is, as a phenomenon. Second, the real component of the appearance or that which participates in the real and has a secondary reality since it depends on the perceiving subject, that is the reality phenomenon in its reality character. Third, the transcendent autonomous reality that is independent of consciousness. According to Conrad Matius, this last sphere, the transcendent autonomous reality, cannot be grasped in and for itself, but only in its primordial essence. However, if the real is precisely the, that which the phenomenon points to and what cannot be perceived in itself, then this would imply that the essence of transcendent reality reveals itself only in its appearance. So we come back mm -hmm. to Conrad Matius' initial question, I quote. We ask, what is reality? This is pure research into essence in the utilitarian sense of eidetics. We ask, what makes or would make out a reality in itself if, if it were factually found or even thought to be found? Quotation ends. Even if the object of investigation is reality, Conrad Matius argues in agreement with Husserl that the actual existence that is the facticity itself or this reality is not inferred from it. Nevertheless, Conrad Matius claims to examine the factual being of finite beings. This means that we can grasp the essence of the being without judging of it on its factual being and without recourse to any constitutive achievement of consciousness which Conrad Matius explicitly rejects. Based on the insights mentioned, Conrad Matius defines ontology as an eidetic science that can never decide anything about factuality in itself. Hence, the epistemological question remains open. Your ontology cannot determine to what extent the empirical world as a whole and in its particular hic et nunc really is what it appears to be as what it appears. Das ist, das wirklich ist, was sie zu sein scheint, als was sie erscheint. End quote. It is left to metaphysics as a factual and not eidetic science to pursue this question. So metaphysics is not concerned with the phenomenon of real being, but with its factuality, that is, with the metaphysical primal questions. Quote, that something is, that it is what it is, that it exists as it is. End of quote. 
But this question exceeds the realm of rational knowledge and thus also that of phenological eidetics. Therefore, in order to address the question about essence of the real being as such, in particular of nature, ontology must inquire not only into reality as a noematic component, but also in the consciousness transcendent reality of the noematic moment of reality. This last sphere is the real reality, wirkliche Wirklichkeit, which does not belong to the intentional noema, but to the consciousness independent factual standing on itself of the world and its existence, a realm that Conrad Matius claims Husserl has disregarded. However, in my view, this criticism does not do justice to Husserl's phenomenology. While it is true that phenomenology does not deal with realities but with ideal possibilities obtained through aesthetic variation, already in the years 1 of 1913, um, factual reality is incorporated into the area of investigation of regional material ontologies, which grasp the concrete essence, essence of material actual beings. It is important to remark that for Husserl, nothing of reality as such was lost with the transcendental reduction. It is rather ascribed to the lived experience, a lipness, as something which is actually included in its essence. However, Conrad Matius' question is quite different. Whether noematic being corresponds to factual being. For Husserl, this realm is grasped by the regional ontologies that ground on the ontology of the life world. In order to emphasize the consciousness independent essence of reality, real reality, Conrad Matius recurs to a hypothetical positing of the world. In this real ontological attitude, the world is assumed to be factually real, regardless of whether it factually exists or not. Conrad Matius introduces thus a double epoche, that is, Conrad Matius brackets both the positing of being in the world and transcendental consciousness. This attitude signifies a step outside consciousness towards an ontic self-rooting of the world in a superphysical and subphysical sphere of potentiality, a realm opened up by the new physics. Thus, Conrad Matthews con contrasts uh, Husserl's metaphysical, ecological, or metaphysical transcendental objectivation with her own transcendent objectivation of the world. Her own conception of an ontological phenomenology does not bracket the actual being and thereby sees the world removed from actual reality, but posits hypothetically the actual being of the world such that it is presented, vorgestellt, as immersed in being. This means that beings are given in that facticity absolutely or independently of consciousness, even if this facticity is merely hypothetical. This connection and intentionality not only reaches what is intuited in its whole, how by means of the judgment as in Husserl, but also the object of intuition itself. Hence, Conrad Matthew hypothesizes the noema itself, that is, the what that is given itself. It hypothesizes the consciousness transcendent reality of the pneumatic moment of reality. Thus, a total of three moments are represented in the noema. First, the real immanence of a merely ideal object. Second, the real transcendence of the empirical object that can be grasped through the respective phenomenon. And third, the real transcendence of the absolute of the metaphysical object that can only be grasped through a leap over, over a factual knowledge limit. In contrast to Husserl's phenomenology, according to which real being can only appear to consciousness as an adumbration given with inadequate evidence, Conrad Matthews take this, takes the view that real reality, wirkliche Wirklichkeit, in its essence, can be grasped as a real beer of a substratum of ma or materiality existing in itself. Thus, Conrad Marcius revises and expands Husserl's correlation in such a way that what is thought relates to a reality that is independent of consciousness. Thus, Conrad Marcius contrasts Husserl's metaphysical, ecological, or metaphysical transcendental objectivation with her own transcendent objectivation of the world, as already said. Come to the last point, the question about primal facts and their origin. 
In her pursuit to unveil the facticity of real being and its configuration as the being that is self-standing and self-grounded with respect to its, its essence, Conrad Matthias endeavors to disclose the self-emergence of the appearance of what in each case appears before or rather exempt from the conditions that the transcendent, that the transcendental subject in Husserl's sense would impose upon it. These investigations can be paralleled with the inquiries of the late Husserl. In research texts from the 1930s, Husserl outlines a phenomenological, phenomenological metaphysics that is grounded in the experience of apodictically given primal facts as the condition for possibility of the eidetic variation and thus cannot be subjected to it. This phenomenological metaphysics encompasses original primal facts as the I, the ego, the world, bodily existence, intersubjectivity, historicity, to which space and time should also be added, that are absolutely self-given and thus make up the absolute reality. They are also primordial structures of my factivity, says Husserl, since in his words, I am the primordial fact in this process. This means that the being real of a transcendental ego is only possible within the framework of these primal facts. The sense and being of these apodictically given primal facts are pre-given to consciousness, such that these proto-facts are the condition for the possibility of the eidetic variation and thus cannot be subjected to it. This self-givenness does not entail a suspension of the consciousness constitutive task. It rather means that the constitution of sense for an ego can only take place retroactively. That is, it can only be applied upon pre-egoic existent facts that are already endowed within an intersubjective and historically or culturally formed sense. Conrad Matzitz's approach to the same topic can be understood as a complement to Husserl's insofar as it is able to disclose the constitutive origin of passive experience with recourse to scientific knowledge. Conrad Matzitz's research traces the origin of real beings back to a transphysical realm, thus revealing the genesis of the Husserlian sphere of primal facts, which itself remains beyond the reach of phenomenological reflection. Conrad Matthews recognizes the need to transcend into the being in itself of the world in order to grasp the objective incomprehensibility of mere factual being or the absolute. Her basic, her basic idea states that the nature that is finished for us and the transcendental consciousness has a real ontological background. The place of origin sought lies in the transphysical realm or trans or meta of the physical in which entelechies unfold their effective force. In the Aristotelian Thomistic sense, these non-special and non-temporal entelechies are understood as effective potencies or energia, which bring about the entire morphogenesis in a pure dynamic of actualization. Resulting from this process, a transition opens up whereby the world itself enters the actual presence. Although this encounter makes the real available for the transcendental consciousness, this real is not structured by it. The world forces itself into consciousness as something other than it. It overcomes it as an event. While Husserl leaves the factual as an unavailable factum brutum in its unquestionability, Conrad Matius discloses its origin in the aeonic space-time, which requires a leap into the depths of the transphysical realm. At this ecstasy, the point at which the real enters the transcendental, phenomenology and real ontology meet and complement one another. Hence, Conrad Matius' real ontological approach is also able to reveal both the process of emergence of the real and the essence of reality or the real reality, issues that were later on taken up by phenomenological realism. In doing so, Conrad Matius not only makes the real available for transcendental perception, but also captures the enable factor, enabling factor of what remains beyond the reach of phenomenological reflection, and thus constitutes an absolute for phenomenology, that is, the place of origin of the Ur factor. This is, in my view, one of the main accomplishments of her original contribution to phenomenology. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Irene, for that wonderful, rich discussion and for positioning Hedwig Conrad Martus's thought in respect to uh, uh, Husserl and uh, the two traditions that are generally associated with phenomenology, the eidetic and the transcendental, and the, the description of a, of a third kind of phenomenological movement that moves, that, that wants to claim that there's um, a more fundamental layer, which is the real. So thanks very much for that. That was very interesting. So um, I just want to remind everyone um, the speaker's bios and the list of some of their works and so on, uh, and as well as the abstracts can be found on the society's webpage. So I invite you to take a look so that you can um, familiarize yourself with our speakers and so on um, uh, as they present their materials and so on. So I'd like to move to our second speaker, Simona Bertolini from the University of Parma. Simona's talk today is called A Metaphysical Dialogue Within the Development of Conrad Martius's Philosophy. And I uh, hear uh, we're going to look at um, the famous dialogue on the soul, <laughs> which is a fascinating text. So Simona, the floor is yours. And again, thanks for being with us. Yeah. So um, uh, good afternoon. I can say that to everyone. I don't know. It depends on the on the country where you live. So good afternoon. Here it's afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation and for being here. Well, first of all, let me explain more precisely the meaning of the title I chose. As Antonio said, me uh, metaphysical dialogue within the development of Corrad Marcius philosophy. Well, with this title. Uh, I mean a dialogue Corrad Marcius conducted with herself, in my opinion, during the development of her metaphysical position. That is a change in this position and the overcoming of her initial metaphysical conception. Uh, in speaking of metaphysics, I refer to the meaning of the word that Corrad Marcius suggests in, in her writing at the beginning of the 30s, Bemerkungen über Metaphysik und ihre methodische Stelle, where she states, that whereas ontology considers the being of the world without dealing with the foundations of its facticity and actual existence, metaphysics, on the contrary, has to do with facticity and with, and with its absolute foundations. Thus, the fact that something is, and not only what it is, is the starting phenomenon of metaphysics, which for this reason is defined as a science of facticity, eine Faktizitätswissenschaft. So um, assuming this definition, what I would like to do in this 20 minutes, more or less, is to show that Corrad Marcius, while elaborating her uh, ontology and philosophy of nature over the years, described two different origins of, of natural existence in the context of a theoretical development in which the philosopher radically recanted her early metaphysical thesis. In order to show this, so in order to show different stages in Corrad Marcius metaphysics, I am going to start from the second stage and then backwards to compare it to the previous one. To be more precise, I am going to refer to some claims in the work Dios um Psyche, published in 1949, and in particular to the first part called The Creative Development of the Living. Here, as the title suggests, Corrad Marcius wonders about the development of the individual living being, she assumes that a mechanistic, a mechanistic explanation is not enough. And while discussing with several biologists of her time, she traces this development back to transphysical factors, that is, to elements which are neither physical, nor psychic, nor metaphysical in the literal sense of the word, but are ontologically present within the physical world without coinciding with it. In this regard, as is well known, the concept of essential entelechy or essence entelechy versus entelechy is crucial, a concept which reinterprets the notion of entelechy elaborated by Hans Drisch. Corrad Marcius presents her notion of entelechy as an original or archetypal phenomenon, an old phenomenon, she says, which essentially belongs to the organic matter and leads its development through the different phases of the organism's life. Such phases, she explains, evolve due to the gradual and active actualization of potencies, which are awakened, so to say, by actualizing powers, the ekmechtigkeiten, 
which gradually realize the specific essence and the specific logos coinciding with the essence and telekin of, of an organism, of a single organism. Thus conceived, this permanent process, this permanent actualization of new potencies is defined as a creative one in the sense that it's not simply the unfolding of potencies which are already virtually present in the physical dimension, but it implies the manifestation, the creation indeed, of transphysical potencies, that is the constant transition from the transphysical to the physical sphere. As Corrad Martius affirms, physical epigenesis is possible thanks to, the, to a transphysical evolutionism. Well, in this context, so while describing her concept of organism, the philosopher mentions Henri Bergson and his interpretation of life and evolution in the work Creative Evolution, so l'Evolution Créatrice, published in 1907. Well, it's in relation to Bergson that we find some sentences, some strong sentences, I would say, which allow us to reflect on the development of Corrad Marsus metaphysics over the years. On the one hand, she claims Bergson has the great merit in underlining both the creative essence and the temporality of living development, which Corrad Marsus associates with the series of phases through which the essence and telekin comes into being. Yet, on the other hand, she adds, Bergson admitted metaphysical absurdities and made the mistake of considering the temporality of life as something absolute. I quote in this regard, she says, there is not life or a stream of life as a creative independent entity. This is an hypostatization. There are only substances which live or bear life in themselves. Even God cannot create life because life is not something that as such can be brought into existence. God can only create something living, living beings, living substances. Life is not in self-creative in absolute sense." End of the quote. So uh, the message is clear. We cannot speak of life as such, but only of concrete living entities considered in their transphysical implications. Life meant as independent force and the land vital is a wrong interpretation of nature, a useless absolutization, a naturalistic exuberance with Corrad Marsus words. Thus, a metaphysics of life is excluded here, and the only metaphysical foundation of the world is God. Although, as Corrad Marsus specifies, one should only resort to God in the normal course of nature when all natural sources have dried up. End of the quote. So I would say that we find clear indications here from both a methodological and a metaphysical point of view. Methodologically, Corrad Martius argues that her philosophy of nature is based on the ontological and transphysical reinterpretation of scientific data without directly resorting to metaphysical arguments in order to explain the process of nature as far as possible at least. Metaphysically, I repeat, she takes for granted that the existence of this process implies the existence of God, admitted as the sole absolute origin of the world and its logos. Whereas the absolutization of life is explicitly denied insofar as life belongs to the spatiotemporal nature in the form of individual living beings and cannot be absolutized as a unitary entity or force. Well, part two, having said all this, I would like to take a step back chronologically and to compare such conclusions to some thesis expressed in one of the fourth uh, Coran Marcus works, Metaphysical Dialogues, published in 1921, in which the philosopher develops her first reflections about nature, natural differences, and evolution through the dialogue of two interlocutors, Montanus and Psilad. First, in this case, I'm going to read some quotations in order to show the evident difference between this work and the statements we have just read in Bios und Psyche. For example, Montanus claims the conversion of life, which hunted and was hungry for substance, in the manifested and unfolded fullness, turns now to be an immediate transition from the darkness to the light of day. MC Lander answers, at the best you can imagine this abyss in which the chaotic life hungers for essence and stability, according to old notions of hell as open jaws that immediately implied themselves the moment of darkness. Or again, another quotation, 
It's the essence of nature to incarnate the fullness of original life in an infinite number of autonomous and individual forms and to fasten it in these ones in a substantial way. Or again, Montanus and Psylander also speak of a dark and hiding ground from which natural forms grow and which takes and holds them back, as well as they mention a pure and universal impulse to achieve a form in the material existence, that is, a yearning for formation of which every material entity is a direct manifestation. End of the quote. So these are just few examples among others taken from the metaphysical dialogues in which we can clearly see that Corrad Marcius at the beginning of her philosophical reflection made exactly the same mistake, so to say, that she would define as a metaphysical absurdity some years later. In fact, as we have seen, she speaks of life as stream of life and a unitary force, in particular as a chaotic force which pushes and presses towards individual forms of reality thus getting away from the shapeless and powerless in the termination of darkness. Otherwise put, it's evident that in this case, there is an original process of life and not all individual living beings. Although such, uh, such a, a process, process is not dead off as the result of an hypostatization, and although it alone has not the power to create the forms of nature, the fact remains that Corrad Marcius, through Montanus and Psylander's words, admit an absolutization of life and the vital origin of nature in addition to the divine origin of God. If compared to what we have read in Biosum Psyche, this implies both a different way to conceive the natural world and further upstream, a different metaphysics. Through the various images that the philosopher uses in the work, so in the metaphysical dialogues, the reader can reconstruct a speculative dimension in which several theoretical elements intervene. On the one hand, the word uh, entelechy is already used in this work to refer to the development of individual living beings according to their essence and logos. On the other hand, Corrad Marcius investigates individual entelechies while digging in their metaphysical genesis and tracing them back to the meeting of two forces. The first force is the above mentioned abyssal force, which yearns for formation, even without potencies within itself, as a sort of pure vital energy, which looks for realization without uh, uh, having the conditions of possibility for it. In this abyss, which is simply nostalgia and living nothingness, nothing is and nothing can originate spontaneously, though all can become from it, as Corrad Marzo specifies. The second force instead, is the creative force of God and life, that is, the force of the divine logos and divine ideas that provides guidance to original life and allows it, allow it to reach material self-determination. Such ideas represent traces which raise the pure nostalgia of the first force towards specific potencies and entelechies and towards concrete actual forms that originate when these essential conditions meet the right environmental conditions. Thus, every natural being can be thought of as the manifestation of this double metaphysical effort, both the pure effort to live and the effort to turn the blind desire from being into the concrete and determined existence in which the divine spiritual logos manifests itself. Furthermore, the vital metaphysical origin admitted and described in metaphysical dialogues has also a crucial role in explaining the ontological difference among natural beings since this difference depends on the different way in which entities, according to their essence, relate to their vital source. This means, for example, that plants take shape and emerge from darkness uh, without diving into their source and from there gaining a psychic depth. Animals instead can dig into the depth of their abyssal ground, which makes it possible to have a psychic center where animal consciousness, however, remains trapped. Human essence finally consists in having a double birth, that is, in being both from below and from above, from both the groundless abyss and from God's spirit, in which human beings participate by elevating from their psychic and purely animal instincts. This means that human spirituality, personality, knowledge, and self-consciousness are understood in light of this free elevation Whereas human natural roots, human psyche, and even human soul 
though illuminated and guided by spirit, maintain their basis in a sort of Dionysian dimension, coinciding with the tonic and maternal ground of nature itself. As Corrad Martius affirms, human being as the demon at her feet and the angel on her head. It is thus evident that the admission of a vital ground at the beginning of the 20s is anything but secondary in Corrad Martius' thought, inasmuch as it's involved in the ontological origin of real work as well as in the explanation of the, live, uh, of the living realm, and in particular of human specificity. This makes even more remarkable the fact that this aspect disappears in the following years, in which the ontic differences keep on being traced back to the development of different essences and entelechies, yet without any references to the notion of original life. Koran Masu speaks here of essential matter, Wesenstoff, but any vital implication that is uh, the image of a force which looks for formation is not present anymore. So in conclusion, on the basis of these assumptions, I am going to, I am going to conclude this short lecture by raising a question that I would like to extend to the audience. And actually I mean a very simple question, that is why? So why in two senses? Why did Corrad Matthews insist so strongly on the idea of a vital and abyssal origin in her early metaphysical reflections? And why did this idea completely disappear in the following research, in which it's even defined as a metaphysical absurdity? So what happened? For clarity, I would begin attempting to answer to the second why. Why did the idea of a vital and abyssal origin disappear after the metaphysical dialogues? Well, I suppose, it's just an hypothesis. I suppose that the legacy of philosophy of life proved to be both incompatible with an authentic Christian metaphysics and unnecessary in order to develop an ontology based on the rigorous dialogues between scientific data and phenomenological approach, which was Corrad Marcy's main goal, as we know. Though the process of life considered as such lent itself to ground the phenomenon of life and the evolution of nature in their general dynamism, it probably turned out to be too ambiguous and dogmatic in the context of a phenomenological observation of natural structures and phenomena. In other words, we can assume that theorizing a pure Dionysian activity boiling, so to say, under the natural forms and in human interiority soon reveal itself as useless to phenomenological analysis and maybe even a possible symptom of a not rigorous approach. In this regard, we can remember the vehement reaction to the metaphysical dialogues as expressed, for example, by Roman in Garden, the phenomenologist, who spoke of poetic fabrication after reading the book, as Edith Stein reminds in a letter to In Garden written in 1921. In the same letter, Stein even claims that the book of Corrad Martius was disturbing for In Garden. And I suppose that this reaction was also due to notions such as chaos, abyss, and demonic entities, notions which were very far from the language of traditional phenomenology, both realistic and transcendental. Well, the same notions which will disappear, not by chance, I guess, from the following philosophy of Corrad Marcius. So this is a possible answer related to the second why. To conclude, we now come to the first why. Why did Corrad Marcius insist so strongly on the idea of a vital and abyssal origin in her early metaphysical reflections? Why did she admit the idea of an elan vital uh, of a universal life? Also in this case, I don't have a precise answer, but I have an hypothesis according to which Corrad Martius does a sort of experiment, a metaphysical experiment at the beginning of the twenties, in which she tries to keep together several traditions. So phenomenology, of course, Christian metaphysics, of course, and philosophy of life, or more in general, more in general, a certain vital atmosphere, a new romantic atmosphere, maybe, which was widespread in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century. So I suppose that when Corrad Martius tries to develop a metaphysics starting from the natural evolution and living phenomena, the description of which was not widespread in the phenomenological tradition yet, well, I suppose that it was almost taken for granted to consider philosophy of life or vitalism as points of reference, also considering the great influence of Bergson in those years, and also considering that one of the goals of vitalism 
was the attempt to defend the specificity of life without reducting it to physical or chemical phenomena. So it's a phenomenological need, all in all. Thus, authors such as Drisch and Bergson, first of all, are evidently polar star stars in this phase. But I also suspect that this interpretation is not enough yet, because it is true that we find a sort of elan vital in the metaphysical dialogues. Well, but I would say that it's a particular strange elan vital, almost a vampiric elan vital. And as far as I know, the reference in this case cannot be Bergson. Rather, I suppose that the reference here is not a single philosopher or a single philosophical position, and perhaps not even the philosophical field considered in a strict sense, but a certain wider cultural atmosphere that Koran Marcius had breathed in Germany since she was a young scholar, not only in Göttingen, but also, and first of all, maybe in Munich. Munich, which was not only the city of the phenomenological Munich circle, but also the city of the Stefan George circle, the city in which Ludwig Klages lived in the first 15 years of the century, and the city in which the Bachofen Renaissance began. So I have the impression that this atmosphere that Koran Marcius surely knew influenced her metaphysics in 1921. And a clue in this direction is the presence in the dialogues of words or topics which were widespread in that tradition at the time such as the notion of demonic, to so the idea of demonic dimension, or the notion of soul meant as a vital part of man, as something radically different from spirit, as Ludwig Klages underlines on several occasions. Thus, I have the impression that there is another cultural tradition, a Nietzschean tradition between the lines of the dialogues, a tradition which will be excluded after a few years. Well, but to say this is just an hypothesis of mine, which would need additional research to be confirmed. And if possible, I would like to have your opinion during, during the discussion. So thank you very much for now. Simona, thank you for that incredibly rich and beautiful talk. Uh, you not only navigated us through the development mm -hmm. and tensions in Hedvig Konrad Martus's thought as it develops, um, but you also ask provocative questions about um, hypostasization and singularities, individuation and the processes of life and how these things should relate. And then your last thesis about the influence of this Munich kind of Renaissance uh, period of fluorescence. Wow, I, um, this is um, completely fascinating as a possibility. So I, I've never really um, thought about that. And then you think of Ludwig Klages and his um, yeah, his influence on phenomenology and Bergson, of course, you've navigated that so brilliantly for us. So thank you for that uh, much um, chapeau, yeah, for that wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, we come now to our final speaker of the afternoon or the evening, depending on where you are <laughs> in the world. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Ronnie, Biron, uh, Ronnie Miron from uh, Barilan University. And the title of her talk today is The New Vocabulary of the Eye. She's just modified the title of her talk a bit. So Ronnie, the floor is yours and welcome and thank you for being with us today. Um, thank you, Ant Antonio, and thank you, everybody. I'm happy to be here, and, uh, and thank you, Diane, for this uh, organizing this uh, wonderful event that it is me in person, very much uh, really exciting to see uh, people joining us to learn about Konrad Matius. Me, myself, really learned a lot from the two uh, presentations by Irena and uh, Simona, uh, so thank you, and uh, if I may, I wish to uh, share with you a, a screen and please confirm if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, I'll, I would like to open uh, with a personal confession, if I may, and drown to forgotten philosophers. I believe that outside the visible areas of culture and knowledge, fascinating new things are happening, free, free from conventions and have been, that have been uh, fixed and have blocked our view of the human. Also, philosophers sh should teach us how to live a life 
that is worth living, a life that elevates what is lost and passes in our existence, a life that has contact with what cannot be fully characterized, something that as it slips away is real and can be experienced. Conrad Matthews suggests a complex, to be honest, sometimes also painful and, and frustrating answer to the question of valuable life. I believe anyone who has dealt with her philosophy has experienced it uh, firsthand. Her thought is not easily surrendered. On the contrary, it brings you back to your questions and thereby indicates that philosophy is an ultimate means for self-understanding. I wish to demonstrate this path from metaphysical questioning to self-understanding through Conrad Matthews' doctrine of the I. The value of this section of her philosophy concerns not only the insight explored in it for humans, but also its establishment of the part of us that can never be understood. She announces this part, confronts it, dubs it with a peculiar vocabulary of her own, and thus provides the means to address it philosophically. However, she suggests no solution to reconcile the intelligible aspect of man with its incomprehensible element. On the contrary, the required metaphysical stance is of facing the contradiction, dwelling in it and thereby experiencing the force of transcendence over individual humans. In short, embracing the dark incomprehensibility incompre inherent in us rather than overcoming it. This is also a great lesson in philosophical modesty that is a lesson of being human. Now, let me briefly outline the main steps in Conrad Martus's marvelous path to the eye. So I'll start with the point of departure that reads as follows. Let's see, see, just a second. In no way does the eye drop out of genuine real positioning. The immediate meaning of this far-reaching determination is that the eye as a real being is subjected to all determinations that apply to any real being. However, this seeming an equivocal determination implies two insight regarding the I. The first, which actually paved the way of Conrad Matus, uh, Matus's way to the philosophical understanding of the I, goes as follows. Only on the ground of being itself, or only out of the ontological foundations of the real being in general, might a true comprehension of the I be enabled. At the same time, Conrad Matus establishes that the I as the last genuine substantial form of being is peculiar and incomparable to any other mode of being. But what does it mean that only out of the ontological foundations of the I, real being in general might true comprehension of the I be enabled? A short detour to Conrad Matus's philosophy of being is needed here in order to move forward. In her magnum opus, Real Ontologie, Conrad Matus describes the fundamental structure of the real being as composed of two inseparable constituents. This is, yeah, just a second. The essence, the vast height or the whatness of the thing and the bearer upon which the essence is loaded. Let us take a look on each of these elements. This is the, our magnum opus. It's appeared in the, in the also as Yarbuch. Uh, and it should be said that we have just, we have just now 100 years after uh, its publication, but it should be noted that the, what was, has been published in the Yabuch is only two of five sections of this book, 
that are still waiting for publication. Now, even nowadays, 100 years after uh, its first appearing, and you can see here it's written uh, uh, first book. Well, the preceding ones never came out. However, let us go to in detail, a bit more detail with uh, the first element of the essence. Conrad Matus explains that the essence is foundational to the intelligibility of any real thing. Thus, the existence of essences implies the possibility of achieving an objective knowledge of, the, of real beings and of reality. Also, Conrad Matus establishes that the objective intelligible logos is a primordial idea, namely a universal form according to which our world, world was constituted. Nevertheless, regardless of its accessibility to our consciousness, this idea does not express the involvement of the human subject. In addressing, in addressing essences, phenomenologists unveil the universal forms of real being and thereby general aspects in reality. And finally, to the aspects of generality and universality inherent in them, real beings can never be exhausted in their empirical mode. The bearer, the second element. Conrad Matthews described the, beer, described the carrying of essence within the real being as pure elevation of being from nothingness. This elevation form not, from nothingness testified to an internal depth within reality. Also, this carrying of essence is a precondition of any real realization in the world, which Conrad Matthews typifies as capability Können, to use our word, whatever is whatever by itself cannot is incapable of anything else, as opposed to the real, which is the only thing that essentially can. And finally, the element of the bearer marks the non-Platonism of Conrad Martis's idea of reality. The loading of essence on the of, on the bearer was visualized by Conrad Matthews as like Atlas vis-a-vis -vis Earth, as like Atlas vis-a-vis -vis Earth, so the real being carries upon its back its real essence. We have seen then that the real is composed of two layers, essence and bearer. While the essence operates inwards, the bearer brings about a manifestation of the constituting essence outwards. The mark of this inward outward directedness is apparent also in Conrad Matus's idea of the eye, specifically within her idea of the spiritual eye. In this regard, Conrad Matthews identifies two elements to what she calls the an ancient movement of the eye that elevates itself from itself towards itself outwardly and into itself inwardly. This is again the ancient movement, okay? And the two uh, element that comprising this element is first is the, excuse me, the origin adhering and the spirit adhering. So now please let me take a, a, a put more details on each of these two aspects, okay? The origin adhering. The aspect of origin adhering characterizes the I as a self that cannot get out of its own origin, but, but must remain within its origin. Therefore, as one digs further into this element, there will always be something deeper. Also, an origin adhering, as origin adhering, the eye cannot have any outside itself, but is incessantly inside itself and by itself. To this extent, the aspect of origin adhering marks the depth of, and, and the fullness of the eye. This element, responds to the characterization of spirit 
as static or spiritual material and as receiving spirit upon which appear concept, words, and phenomena. However, Conrad Matthews argues that these spiritual achievements are shaped by, by the objective logos of the real world. She explains that despite being standing, resting in itself and directed towards itself, the receiving spirit is always shaped anew by the intelligible reality and becomes this reality itself. This could not have happened if the spiritual material did not have inherent in itself a radical capability for becoming manifested by the light of spirit. In any event, Conrad Matthews considered the receiving spirit as a tabula rasa because it is capable of being filled by the eternal ideas of reality or being an appropriate observer of pure essences. So this is again the origin, uh, the, the, the element of origin adhering. And as we can see, it, she, there are some distinct char um, characterization by, given by Conrad Matthews scattered in her, all her writings regarding this element. How about the second element, which is spirit adhering or uh, geistlichhafte Zelderkeits? This element of spirit is described again as a power of being. By its being power, being by its being's power, spirit, spirit appears as totally empty of itself, down to, down to its most internal ground. Thus, it indicates an abyss inside the being of the eye. Conrad Matthews terms this element with the unique idiom, idiom infostase, which indicates the capability of the spiritual eye to elevate itself and be directed to something that is not itself. Thus, infostase of the, is the dynamic element of the spiritual being and a pure, genuine, selfless power of the eye. As spirit adhering, the eye operates as influencing spirit without having inside itself something to be positive against what it receives. Thus, as an influencing spirit, the eye is described as floating or pending with logos. This infostatic character that provides the eye, so to speak, a window outside itself, yes, enables it to encounter the world and cognize it, and thereby, the scope of the eye is widened. However, within its elevated form from itself, elevating from itself, and despite Conrad Matthews' depicting of such elevating as self-abandoning, the eye, the human spirit constitutes, continues to be incessantly and se se selfless and verified as an origin of itself. In her words, the eye elevate itself from itself towards itself outwardly and into itself inwardly. Against this background of the infrastatic character of spirit, one can come to terms with Conrad Martin's typifying of the I being as dwelling in transcendence. Conrad Matthews concludes then that the spiritual I does not live only by itself, but also in a strange world. However, even as spirit rests in itself, it is already transcending its own being. The question that we can raise at this point is how do these two rather different and even polarized elements relate to each other? In my view, the logic behind uh, this duality is the following. The self-compression that occurs in the eye as a receiving spirit builds the substantial core that serves as a safe ground. This in turn enable the self to void itself and attain freedom and mobility towards the world. In short, only an owner, only owner of something can release themselves from their property. 
this insight that might be derived from this logic can be specified as follows. The two elements of the spiritual eye operate simultaneously. Thus, the eye adheres to its, to, to its dark origin and can free itself by an elevating act operated by infrastatic self, selfness. However, the unity of the self of the I is not given, but rather a task to be achieved. The I is located, located at the middle point. It moves between self-abandoning and being directed back to oneself. Thus, being beyond oneself, the I reaches itself without ceasing to be itself for a single minute. Alternatively, the externalization of the substance of the I to the point of selfless, self loss, excuse me, is the infrastase is <coughs> in the infrastase is an expression of spirit's freedom, yet by its content, it is selfless. This understanding of the I is moving within the realm of the free spirit, forces the vacillating that is essential to human existence. Namely, we are doomed to move between ownership and freedom from it, between selffulness and positive self voice, void, between being a receiving spirit and influencing spirit. Spirit will never be located in either side, but vacillates between the two. In short, the dual structure of the I as spiritual being indicates the fate of human existence as vacillating between freedom and selflessness. Now, precisely as the duality of the real being composed of essence and bearer is regarded as a based on formal relation that cannot be destroyed, also the duality of the I cannot be overcome. In Colat Matus's view, this duality is ultimately founded in the entire ontic situation of finite being as such, possessing two op opposing extremes, an autonomic and causal sui on the one hand, and the scrapitude of being surrounded with threatening of nothingness on the other hand. In her view, in her view it is odd to wish a position, uh, imposition of a unification of the two in one and the same existent. She puts it as follows. The state of affairs includes within itself the two. The two together first determine the concrete ontic unity that depicts the finite existence. We are not dealing here with a contradiction that can be roughly dialectically unified. No, every autonomic being have their own thing stands on totally, totally different points or totally different planes of the totality of existence. I'm coming to, conclusion, to the conclusion. The duality is an essential datum of any finite being and reality in general, hence the possibility of overcoming of, of course, excuse me, the possibility of converging into a unity is regarded, regarding the I is excluded. Second, both elements of the I must be preserved and persist in their difference. And the duality of the I does not indicate its being a double being, rather the I that transcend persists in, the transcend, in its transcending in Conrad Matis's word in design. We should not first set down as, re as ready this eye and then put it again outside itself. This would have canceled all the ontological meaning of the matter. No, this eye as one and whole constitutes itself in general only in this self belonging ontic transcription towards outwards above itself that is simultaneously transposition back beneath itself. However, 
since there is not and cannot be a meeting point between the part that operates inwards and the part that is addressed outwards, the doubling of the eye is necessarily not its duplication. In my opinion, Conrad Matis is insistent upon preserving the dual structure of the real being and, uh, and the eye as, a well, as well expressed her way of standing before the two paths of escape from the question of reality typical of modern philosophy. A abstraction of reality and establishing as a, 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 it as an ideal within an abstract system, for example, in idealism, and concretization of reality into material fulfillment and accordingly approaching it with empiricistic tools taken from the positive school. As opposed to this, the dual structure keeps its grip, grip in, on both the raw material aspect of the real being, the bearer and the original aspect of the eye and the open horizon that is at the same time, the intelligible dimension of reality. Each of the two provoke, provokes the need of the other, yet in no way, way they can merge into each other. As far as I know, this understanding of the self has no equal in the history of philosophy. Moreover, the vocabulary with which her ideas are articulated is totally unique. Thus, due to its realistic commitment, Conrad Matus's philosophy of the eye is not leveled from the study of consciousness. At the same time, she does not fall into a materialistic position. On the contrary, the self is understood as a spiritual being altogether. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ronnie, for that wonderful discussion of the eye. It's a pretty bold, radical thesis that Hedvig Conrad Marx puts forward in this, in this, uh, this, um, these two poles as they move, the originary and the spiritual and so on. This is very different than the traditional Husserlian idea of the ego and uh, certainly much um, stronger um, than a Steinian or a Voltairian idea. Um, yeah, so, Thank you for that. That was uh, brilliant. I really appreciated that wonderful talk. You know, often we don't hear about the I in Hedwig Conrad Martius. You know, this is really um, something that really is um, fantastic that you're doing. Thank you. I so, think that this is, if I may, this is an aspect that, that the realist uh, phenomenologists suffer from such, so many prejudices as if they did not pay attention to the I and they were just dogmatic yes. about concrete reality being back, taking us back to the medieval time. And she puts again a new vocabulary addressing the eye, not via its consciousness and still paying attention to its intelligible parts yes. that are still operative in her idea of the eye. Wonderful. Uh, we have, um, just before we open up the floor to questions and to further dialogue and exchange, um, we had um, one audience member ask if, um, if you'd like, um, ask the speakers if they had, if they could share their presentations in the chat. So if you could upload your presentations, if you want, you, you, if they're written, uh, um, uh, just so that um, audience members are um, keen to read your work <laughs> and have it. So if you'd like, please feel free to upload that material in the chat and um for everyone to access, that'd be great. And Brianne can help us if we need to. So we come to the, the best part of the, um, in addition to these wonderful presentations, Hannah Arendt always said, you know, that this kind of um, <laughs> what lies between us in, in speech, uh, this is uh, what is um, fruitful and meaningful and so on. And so um, I'd like to um, uh, invite members of the audience first to, share any ideas or reflections or questions so that we can help build that in between that inter essay <laughs> that Hannah Arendt speaks about and which uh, in many ways um, inspires us here in the society to create these kind of spaces of dialogue and so on so I open the floor if you can just uh, raise your hand um, uh, and uh, go ahead or um, so we'll give people a minute just to reflect uh, Diane please yeah 
Antonio, I just wanted to mention that the people who asked you for their talks may not be aware that we are recording it. So that's also, um, we oh, will sure. post it on, we will post it on our website, the three talks. Oh, great. Thanks for that, Diane. I appreciate that. Forgot about that. Uh, so the floor is open if anyone would like to share uh, comments or questions for our speakers. Joyce, please. Yeah, welcome, Joyce. Thank you. Thank, and I want to thank three speakers. I'm not a philosopher by profession. I do philosophy as part of being a historian and being a Steinian scholar. And so there were aspects of your presentations which I could not adequately follow and other parts I very much could. But I do have um, a related, well, it's a two-part question. I'm very aware of the huge impact of Hedvig Card Conrad Martius on Stein's thinking uh, throughout the 1920s and into well into the 1930s. They had a very close friendship, intimate friendship. And um, I'm very aware of that. And I wonder about the impact of Stein on Hedvig Con Conrad Martius, since I only know it the other way around, the impact of Martius on Stein. So I would, I'm curious about that. And it relates to the fact that in establishing reality and establishing the I, for Stein, intersubjective relationships are central. That is the fact that empathy initially, in fact, it was foundational to her view of the reality of the existence of the self. And um, I'm curious how you would apply concepts of intersubjectivity to your discussion of Hedvig Conrad Martius's conception of the real and of the I. Um, and so I guess that's my, my fundamental question. Thank you, Joyce. I invite the speakers to perhaps if they, to please feel free to respond. Well, if I may, can you hear me? Yes. Well, about the relation between Stein and Conrad Martius, uh, 